Okay, looks like we're live. Welcome to Shadowproof Events. I'm joined by David Dion, longtime blogger of a former publication, Fire Dog Lake, who wrote a new book called Chain of Title about the 2008 financial crisis and then the afterward housing crisis. Um, I actually wrote a review of it today, which you can see on the website, which leads me, I guess I'll go just jump into the first question. Um, one of the things I noticed about this book as I was reading it, and it's a great book, is that you focused on different people than every other film or book I've seen written about the crisis, which focuses on regulators too big to fail or, you know, the, the uh, hedge fund, uh, the big short, which is probably the most famous one, which is about these short sellers. Um, why did you want to focus on, I guess, what... Uh, <laughs> was it that show? <laughs> the little people. You know, why did you want to focus on the people at the lower end and what what made you want to focus on that area, I guess, is my real question. Sure. Well, first, thank you uh, uh, for bringing me back home here to uh, the artist formerly known as Fire Dog Lake. <laughs> you, uh, it, you know, uh, a lot of my reporting about this crisis started right here. Um, and when I was doing that reporting, what seemed to pop most for people is to tell real stories, real stories of the people most powerfully affected by the crisis. That's really how I got started writing about this. Uh, I, I would write uh, you know, stories of, of people uh, trying to navigate the HAMP program, the Home Affordable Modification Program, and their nightmares that they were going through. And so it was a really conscious choice that I wanted to focus on homeowners because so many of these crisis narratives haven't. Uh, they've left them out of the equation. And in particular, these three homeowners were really the perfect opportunity for that because uh, they were part of the very few who, you know, got into trouble, got their foreclosure notices, and actually read them and then uh, found irregularities within them and didn't stop there, but instead of just fighting their own foreclosures, uh, tried to fight uh, this entire system, which they uh, uncovered through public record searches and, and, and deep investigation, more so than, than the federal or state governments, really. Uh, and so, you know, I thought following them on this journey of discovery peeling back their, their, what they learned, sort of like the layers of an onion, was really a, a nice way to get into this story and get you invested in it. Right, and that's actually a good, that's something I, when I was reading the book and thinking about, because I know you and I know your background, when I'm reading about how there was this, the, the people you profiled, they use blogs themselves, and you're looking at, um, uh, foreclosure Hamlet and the number four closure fraud, and I wonder as a quote unquote lapsed blogger, is it? I forget exactly. <laughs> whether you that how you reacted to seeing that these people had basically done in their own lives, they'd come to blogging, and what do you think? Yeah. What role do you think blogging played in their activism? What did you think about it when you saw it as a blogger? It played a major role. Um, uh, you know, that's really how I first got to know them is by reading their blogs uh -huh. and getting the information from that. And uh, the the funny thing is, is that this was a really unique project to work on because I had just like they had a paper trail that they discovered. I had a paper trail of everything they did at every step, every single day by reading their blog entries. And uh, you know, uh, part of my research for this book was reading their blog entries and lining them up and matching what they told me with what was on the blog and, and making sure everything fit together. So that was, a, that was like a decent part of the research. I think there's this moment sort of between 2007 and 2011 when, you know, if people want to write books about that time period, there's this huge paper trail, as long as it doesn't go dead of all of these blogs and you can really pinpoint day to day what people were doing and what they were focusing on. So that was actually a big part of the research and uh, you know part of what I wanted to tell is this story of movements and this story of sort of networked movements and how you could leverage the internet to work on research projects to build uh, sort of attention to them uh, to, to try to get the word out uh, in a way that, you know, we've sort of lost in this age of Twitter and Facebook. 
And so, you know, I really wanted to explore that, and, and certainly I, I, I definitely agreed with and sympathized with the sort of obsession that they got into, you know, having to comb through their Google Reader and make sure they didn't miss any, any breaking stories and, and, and have the, to do that every single day and get up posts every single day. I mean, obviously, I, I really uh, was affected by that. So the, actually, that's interesting. So that's kind of like a, I want to say, a class-based thing where the people who, like Aaron Sorkin, who wrote, or Andrew Ross Sorkin, whoops, yeah. <laughs> who wrote that Too Big to Fail, he's just, it's basically almost, uh, I'll be a little diplomatic, a uh, transcript of what Hank Paulson wanted him to write. It seemed like he almost wrote yeah. it himself. He's, you know, looking at press releases. He's in a press pool. He's being sort of fed certain stories. And so that's who he covers. And whereas you're going into more of the average person's response, maybe that's why you were in the blogosphere, because they don't have press agents. They don't set up things <laughs> with the New York Times. That's an, kind of an interesting part. Yeah. But I, I also want to kind of push towards... I think you have, there's a lot of different parts of this crisis, right? There's, on the regulatory side, there's also what happened in the MBS market in terms of people cheating other people. Mm -hmm. But then there's this second crisis that I don't think, besides you, anyone's focused on, at least in this depth. So I don't want to mislead people in the book. It covers really the gamut of it, but it has a particular focus on what people would call fraud closure, which mm -hmm. was something that happened after a lot of the bailout, after a lot of the press kind of lost interest or wasn't just not in tune with it. So for people who don't know, what is fraud closure, quote unquote, what, and what did you find when you investigated it? Yeah, well, I mean, one thing I learned in the book is that it had been going on since the 1980s, uh, which was really surprising. Uh, you know, we start with uh, this guy, Nye LaValle, who, who learned uh, about uh, the foreclosure fraud in his own case. Uh, which went back 25 years, which is really incredible to think about. But uh, what in the basic terms foreclosure fraud uh, designates is this mass production of false documents to be used to support foreclosure cases. Uh, in any kind of uh, uh, legal setting, if you're trying to enforce a foreclosure lien, you're a, for, you're, a, you're a mortgage company, you have to prove at some point down the line that you actually own that mortgage. Uh, just no different than if I accused you of stealing my car, I would have to prove that I had title on the car, that I own the car at some level. Uh, during securitization, when these loans were originated, sold immediately to an investment bank, sliced and diced, uh, and, and put into a trust and, and sold all around the world as mortgage-backed securities, uh, there were very precise steps that are well-grounded in property law that dates back to the 1630s that have to be followed in order to properly transfer a loan. Uh, and none of that was ever followed. Uh, it would have been too costly. It would have been too time-consuming. You would have had to go do physical document transfers hold the documents with a custodian, and physically get them to the trust, which was spelled out in these very complex agreements that all the parties made. It wasn't a regulatory uh, uh, mandate, but the parties, when they said, we're going to do this, there was a very specific thing that said, you have to get these mortgages to the trust within 90 days, and they didn't do it. And so when they went back, this wouldn't have been a problem, I guess, if all the loans, you know, passed through and, and everybody paid their mortgages, but uh, it was sort of a ticking time bomb for this scenario. So when the bubble burst and when uh, hundreds of thousands, millions of people started defaulting, uh, in order to get those through the system and to get the foreclosures done, uh, they had to come up with some documents that proved that they owned the, the mortgage in some fashion. And so in order to affect that, they, they just mocked up the documents. They, they used third parties, or the law firms did it themselves, or the mortgage servicing companies did it themselves. But whatever way in which they did it, they basically fabricated these documents and used that false evidence in court cases all over the country uh, and also submitted them to county recording offices as if they were real and uh, to support this contention that they owned the loan. And uh, in any other judicial context, if you used false evidence to try right. to, you, you, would, you would lose that case. You would lose that case in 10 seconds. 
But uh, banks decided, okay, what we can do is just wave around a piece of paper, and that's going to get us uh, uh, out of this mess that we created for ourselves. And uh, uh, the story follows these three individuals, uh, Lisa Epstein, an oncology nurse, uh, Michael Redman, a car salesman, and Lynn Simoniak, who was uh, an insurance fraud specialist, white-collar crime specialist. And it follows those three as they find this fraud in their own documents and then find it everywhere and then build a movement through blogs and through uh, offline activity as well to, to try to expose it. Yeah, and what you brought up that was so interesting, at least for me, maybe this is because I'm a bit of a nerd on some of this stuff, is... You talked about the history of why, of not, you know, dating back 300 years of why we have property, how it works, and how it was traditionally, and this is something I even didn't even know before MERS, that county governments, of course, I would always assume were in charge of it. That's hence, you know, a big job here, at least here in the state of New Jersey, is, you know, county clerk, not just yeah. for elections, but they control all the paperwork, they have all the deeds, they should have all the records. Mm -hmm. And what was so fascinating reading through this is how the, that they created their own system called MERS, uh, Mortgage Electronic Registration System, and didn't clue in county governments. It was basically their own private system, and because they did it essentially to avoid fees and regulations, they ran it poorly, and there was no <laughs> real oversight. Right. And it's so fascinating because one of the critiques, and you go into this a bit because you do give some of the overview about capitalism and how it's supposed to work is, you know, information is the basis for all this. That's why people do deeds. And, and a lot of people, when this thing broke, this financial crisis says, oh, nobody knows the information. Nobody has information control. But what you point out, and it's very important, I would love for you to go into this, is they wrested information control from the county governments and took it into their own hands with MERS and then proceeded to screw up and then cover up. So can you go into MERS, yeah. what it is, and how it became central to the crisis and fraud closure? Right. So like you said, MERS was pretty much a tax evasion tool, uh, or fee evasion tool, if you will. Uh, yeah, these county governments, uh, county recording offices, uh, going all the way back to the 1630s, uh, stored publicly uh, the records of, of properties uh, within their county, within their jurisdiction. So if you went to your county recording office, you should be able to figure out from the moment that your house was built, everyone who's held title on that property. It's the chain of title. That's, that's the reason for the name of the book. Right. So uh, you're supposed to be able to do that. Now, uh, during securitization, these loans got transferred multiple times for each loan, you're talking about millions of loans, that's tens of millions of dollars because each transfer requires documentation and a nominal fee that gets paid to the county office. And in addition to the manpower and the labor to, to record the documents, make the documents, ship them, store them with the custodian and all of that. So they created this thing called MERS and uh, the banks own MERS, it's a shell corporation, there are 60 employees. However, all they really do is handle a spreadsheet. So when a loan was originated, uh, they would immediately whip out an assignment to say, this loan went from the originator to MERS. MERS is the originator of this loan, or the nominee is what they would say for the loan. And then all these transfers that would take place would take place inside this MERS spreadsheet. And then at the end of the process, whoever needed to foreclose, the foreclosing entity, uh, would they would whip out a quick assignment from MERS onto the foreclosing entity. As far as the local uh, county recorder knew, uh, there were no other transfers. It was just MERS. And this was all happening inside a database which held 60 million loans at the height and had thousands of, of people who had access to it who did not do a very good job of keeping the records. There was one uh, a study done by a guy named Alan White, a professor uh, out of Valparaiso, I believe, who uh, compared the uh, information in public recording offices with the information on the MERS database and found that they correlated only 30% of the time. So this was just wildly uh, uh, erroneous. And as you said, it became a problem when they had to go to foreclose because these documents that were whipped out that said, oh, MERS just sent it over to Deutsche Bank or whoever, uh, they weren't done at the proper time, number one, 
And uh, there was questionable legality of whether MERS, who had no interest in the loan, could actually transfer title. And that, that was the basis of lawsuits in all 50 states. Right. And what's so there's this private kind of wacky system or dysfunctional, inefficient system. They control it. It's not going through county government hands. But one of the reasons it seems that you point to that became a major, I think, focus point for all the financial crisis stories is a concept that even people who aren't news junkies like us would get, which is the revolving door. And when people think of that, at least who have followed national politics, they may think of someone like Robert Rubin, who goes from Goldman Sachs uh, to Treasury Secretary to Citigroup. But what I was blown away by when I was reading this book was there's people on the lower level who are revolving door people, and there's someone you pointed out, Aaron uh, Calero, who's oh, yeah. working for the Florida state government in the, in the investigating mortgage fraud and moonlighting as a notary, and, and she is part of these documents that are coming out about these sort of uh, robo-signing and these sort of fraudulent documents. Yeah. She's... Not, it's not even a revolving door. She's still in government when she's involved in these practices. So talk about lower level uh, peddling influence, lower level revolving door that can hurt someone like the people you profile in your book. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. It's a really amazing uh, little subplot of this story. Erin Culero uh, started her career with uh, a law firm called Florida Default Law Group that became one of the biggest uh, they call them foreclosure mill law firms because they churn out foreclosures the way a mill would churn out sweaters or something. So um, Erin Calera worked for them, and then she moved into government in the Economic Crimes Division of the Florida Attorney General's Office. And But she didn't want to quit the big gig that she had at uh, Florida Default Law Group, so she got a waiver that she could sign documents and there were specific time frames when she was allowed, like 15 minutes a day, three days a week. Um, and she signed like 150,000 documents. <laughs> uh, it was clearly not in that time frame. There were days where the documents were signed that didn't correspond to those days of the week. Uh, the documents that she was signing, sometimes she would be the notary, sometimes she would be the witness. Her sister was also signing, also was the notary of the witness, and when this was all exposed, her husband started being the signer. <laughs> so there was like a real problem in that area of Florida with getting good employment outside of the Culero family. They were the <laughs> ones who apparently had the, the ability to, to get all this done. And uh, Lisa Epstein uh, figured this out because it was in her case that there was a document signed by Erin Calera, and she did some digging and realized she worked for the Florida Attorney General's office. She ended up having a meeting with people at the Florida Attorney General's office where the first thing in the meeting, she confronts these investigators and says, uh, is Erin Calero a, a colleague of yours? They're like, yeah, she works with us. Why, why is that? And she goes, well, she, her name's on my mortgage documents. And I don't know why. And they say, stay here. This is ridiculous. This was never happening. They slam the door, and they leave Michael and Lisa in there for like a half hour thinking that they're about to be arrested, or they have no idea what's going on. And they finally, the investigators, who is uh, Teresa Edwards and June Clarkson, come back and say, uh, yes, this was our Aaron Culero, and we're going to have to investigate this. She didn't get fired for a year after that, which is <laughs> uh, incredible. Um, but, you know, talking about the low-level revolving door or, or whatever you want to call it, uh, it's clear that there was a lot of petty stuff going on in Florida and around the country uh, because I call this sort of the great foreclosure machine. That's kind of the, the phrase that I use in the book. Yeah. And everyone's a cog in it, uh, they're, they're, whether it's these law firms or these third parties that create the documents or uh, process servers or all of them, and they're all looking to get their cut out of the homeowner uh, or out of the investors. They're all looking to get their cut out of the foreclosure industry. And so everyone's sort of a cog in this machine right on up to, you know, uh, you could talk about Eric Holder and Lanny Brewer who worked at Covington and Burling, who was the, co the, the law firm, the White Shoe Washington law firm, that created the legal documents that authorized MERS to be used. Right. I mean, 
they, they created the underpinning, the, the legal underpinnings for MERS. So, you know, it's really up and down the line in, in terms of what you were talking about. And, and just there was a lot of money to be made in foreclosures. It was a growth industry in places like Florida. And everybody wanted a piece of the action. And, you know, that's an interesting point. And also what you brought up in the book that I was really taken by was that this actually extended, I mean, I wasn't so naive, but that to the judicial branch. Sure. But one thing that was completely new, and maybe this is, and I'd follow the news pretty regularly, is there were, were, there were lawyers who were part of what you term in the book foreclosure defense, which were people who were helping homeowners. Now, the reason I might not have heard of it is because if you looked at any of the results, you would think these people clearly don't have lawyers. I mean, they're getting... Um, Rocket dockets, which are these fast-moving tri pace trials where the judge just sort of rules, boom, boom, boom. You're in foreclosed, you're foreclosed. So, but this is something that was completely new to me, and I followed this. So, just I guess uh, give us a little bit of information about foreclosure defense, the the practice, and some of the foreclosure defense people you interacted with, and what you kind of learned about the process. They clearly didn't prevail, but they at least were fighting a bit. Oh, absolutely. Um, so I I kind of present that in the book as Lisa and Michael learn about it. They think they're on this island that they have to teach the lawyers because nobody knows what's going on. Uh, they haven't studied it. Uh, to be honest, a lot of the early foreclosure defense, the foreclosure defense wasn't really a thing until the financial crisis really hit. Uh, a lot of them were ex-real estate lawyers. They used to do closings and then, you know, they saw something else to do really. And a lot of these foreclosure defense attorneys had to really self-taught, you know, they had to get self-taught themselves, much like Lisa and Michael did, uh, in terms of what the law was and what, uh, you know, trying to understand it all. So I start with a lady named April Charney, who was really one of the pioneers, you know, finding this case law and, and you know, presenting these cases as far back as the 90s. Uh, her and this guy Max Gardner out in North Carolina who actually ran a, a boot camp for lawyers to come in uh, and, and teach them about foreclosure defense because it was really a brand new piece of the law. Most foreclosures are not contested, about 95% of them. But when you had millions of cases going on uh, at this time, uh, and when you saw this documented evidence that there was a serious fraudulent activity going on with these foreclosures, there was a need. And there were these lawyers, they were, there wasn't all of them, but there were these lawyers that, that saw this opportunity. And not only did they try to pursue this in their own cases, but they tried to teach other lawyers what was going on. So Max Gardner with his boot camp, uh, April Charney would go around the nation giving seminars, uh, she, you know, some of the people she taught ended up being, uh, you know, very instrumental, like Matt Widener, who started his own blog, which was very influential at the time, in addition to running his cases. Uh, Thomas Ice and Ice Legal uh, ended up working very closely with Lisa and Michael, uh, and they would feed them depositions that they would put on their own website, and that really is what uh, brought this robo-signing scandal to light is the use of depositions to get the employees themselves to uh, essentially cop to the scheme, to say, uh, yes, I signed 5,000 documents a week, and I have no idea what they mean, and I have no <laughs> idea what they say. Uh, and so that was really, really the, the linchpin of, 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 you know, at the end of 2010, all of these mortgage companies stopping their foreclosure operations because they were really exposed, and it was it was the legal uh, community, uh, particularly in Florida, but also all around the country, that, that really brought that to light. And, and Max Gardner is an interesting character, and also an interesting point to pivot on. And I don't know if you did this on purpose or or it was just the way you compile the facts. But what struck me was you you know start because you start from the beginning to end. This, like I said uh, in my review, this is a great way if you if you don't understand the financial crisis and you need to get a point by point explanation of how we got from A to Z. This is a great book for that. But you, you, you talk with uh, Ren, Lewis Ranieri, who was yeah. famously profiled in Liar's Poker by Michael Lewis, who of course Michael Lewis also wrote The Big Short, yeah. and you you had this quote in there that struck me, and you said, you know, well, Ranieri would just say we get the law changed. <laughs> and then another scene, another scene with Max Gardner, you have him arguing with someone who we don't know, some vice president, quote unquote, vice president of a mortgage 
Association who says, you know, we'll just get the laws changed if you beat us. And then Gardner said, well, maybe we can get the laws changed back <laughs> at you. And this pivots to an, a really important point because it seems like for activists, journalists, all us whiny lefties, um, every time we someone like uh, Lisa and these other brilliant people come up and they beat them at their own game, like they actually get them to court, they change the rules. Mm -hmm. And it seems like for, for people who are really uh, passionate about this, it almost seems hopeless because every time you beat them, they come back and figure out, they change the rules, as Ranieri said or this unnamed guy said. Now, I'm going to take it back a little bit. Why not? Because I'll be the, I'll, you can be the sober realist. I'll be the, the lefty out of, out of here <laughs> nowhere. Now, is there a larger critique of the system itself? Um, you know, after the crisis, people were very desperate for any kind of explanation. So this guy, um, Richard Wolff, who's a Marxist professor, offered that if you keep corporate power unmolested where it is, you will always eventually, they will eventually roll you back because they have the interest and they have the resources to do that. Mm -hmm. So from from your perspective, was is there a way to actually get beat them and have it stick, or do we have to change the structures of power for that ever to even be possible? I mean, that's a big question, but, you know, you wrote a book, so <laughs> <laughs> throw it at you. Now I, now I get to be the sober centrist in I'm this. Sorry. Um, well, I mean, you know, I... I I mean, I guess I don't want to take it too far away from the subject at hand, but certainly in this case, what we did see is uh, a sort of a textbook definition of what you're supposed to do to affect change and to and to gather, you know, some measure of justice. These people saw injustice happening. They they broadcast it widely. They found a coalition. They went through the protocols, went to every position of authority they could. In fact, their entire idea was to expose this, and then someone was going to take it and come up with a solution, <laughs> and then they could walk away. And they did that. They did everything uh, up to that point, at only when someone was supposed to come in and come up with a reasonable solution, they didn't. So uh, what does that say about our country? And I, I think those are important questions to ask. I don't know that I necessarily have the answers to them, but I think they're important questions to ask. And uh, what I would say is that I think this was an early version of people kind of uh, questioning this system in a broader way. They were doing it just on this subject of foreclosure fraud. However, I think that the kinds of critiques that Lisa and Michael were making and Lynn uh, prefigure Occupy Wall Street. They prefigure uh, the low-wage fight for 15. They prefigure the Bernie Sanders uh, campaign uh, in many ways. So uh, this this yearning to sort of uh, have an explanation uh, and and to come up with why there's this two-tiered system of justice, at least in this case, uh, between you know everybody on one side and the powerful on the other. I think uh, that question has, it fuels a lot of the anxiety, frustration, and anger in our politics. And, uh, you know, I think it would be in, in the probably the best interest of, of the sober elite centrists uh, to, to get a handle on this problem before it spins out of control, because people uh, really have, have, have got a, a major problem with this. I call it in the first line of the book, uh, in the preface, I say there is a rot at the heart of our democracy, and and I think uh, the book and the fact that there was an alternative and that a road that wasn't taken uh, really really reinforces that. Right, and and actually that and that pivots to a question I or a scene that you painted, and the book is very well written. This is very nice prose, and I was there's a little little poetry in your son, uh, <laughs> but I was reading. But so there's all these very vivid scenes painted, and one of them that struck me was um, Lisa Epstein is at, um, I believe it's a Roosevelt Institute uh, gathering in D.C., and she's walking out, and a guy who I think we, I know you know him a lot better than me, but I certainly admire, uh, Matt Stoller is there. Yeah. And he kind of pulls her aside, cause she's, and she's apparently feeling good, like, look, everybody else, and he says, look, <laughs> uh, the two people that you really need to get behind you on this are Eric Holder, the Attorney General, and Lanny Brewer, who's head of the criminal division at the Justice Department, and I've got some bad news for you. 
<laughs> in their former lives before they were appointed by the Hope and Change president, they were Wall Street lawyers at Covington and Burling. And besides all the big banks who were their clients, they provided the legal opinion for MERS, as I think you mentioned earlier. And so uh, this, is, this is a sort of more general question. When, when I saw, uh, you know, I was an Obama supporter, I guess, who wasn't, right? He won, obviously. So um, when I saw these appointments happen, mm -hmm. and I saw him appoint Tim Geithner again, Larry Summers, and then you see him appoint two Wall Street lawyers. For me, that was a signal, and it's easy to see this in hindsight, but even at the time, I trust me, people, even at the time, I went, I went, man, I don't think Obama's for real. Now, on the other hand, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau is there. There have been, Dodd-Frank is, well, not that powerful, it's there. So mm -hmm. what's your read on those appointments of appointing two Wall Street lawyers to the head, the very head of the Justice Department, in the aftermath of one of the biggest financial crises. How did you read that? What do you make of those appointments? Because it seems to me like the fix was in. Well, thank you for bringing up that scene, because I think it is really important and central. It's actually Lynn uh, Simone. Oh, I'm sorry. I apologize. Which is fine. Which is fine. Uh, that Matt pulled aside. And, and, you know, Lynn was the one who was trying to work the system on the inside. She... Uh, you know, put together cases where she tried to use the justice system to, to you know, sue the banks. She put a, a key TAM lawsuit together to try to sue them under the False Claims Act. She wanted to do a RICO case. She triggered an investigation in Jacksonville, Florida, uh, that got the FBI involved and got a grand jury involved uh, that was a criminal investigation into this misconduct. And so for Matt to tell her, yeah, I don't think this is going to work out for you, uh, that, was, that was a big moment for her. Uh, and she still had that sort of cockeyed belief that justice will win out, and if you have the facts on your side, then it'll all work out. And she becomes disillusioned through the last kind of third of the book. Uh, as far as, you know, uh, with, with respect to Holder and Brewer, I think you only have to look at outcomes. Uh, this, this was, uh, an, uh, you know, a situation that was far worse than the savings and loan scandal when almost a thousand bankers went to jail. Uh, and, uh, you know, there were immediate rushes to settlement and, and for most of this conduct, and the part in which there was supposed to be a criminal outcome, this big task force that they put together, never issued a single criminal subpoena. So, uh, I, I, you know, Lynn describes this thing with the Justice Department where they had her, they were working on her case, and they had her fill out these things called confidential information disclosures. And these were like kind of subpoena-like structures that took hours for her because they had to know what questions to ask the banks for what documents they wanted to receive. She spent dozens of hours on these CIDs and uh, then would get notes on them from Justice and she would continue to do them back and forth and back and forth. What she learned at the end when all the information was released is that they never even issued the confidential <laughs> information disclosures. Right to the banks. It was all a smokescreen and you know you can draw your own conclusions about who they were protecting and and what 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 the true you know realization was of that but I'll tell you this I mean what happened at the end was that Lanny Brewer and Eric Holder went right back to Covington and Burling. In fact right. uh, they held open a corner office for Eric Holder uh, in their new headquarters while he was still a sitting attorney general negotiating with banks who were Covington and Berlin clients. So uh, I, I, you know, I, I think I don't have to say much more than that uh, about that particular aspect. Well, uh, well, let me draw a conclusion. Um, okay. So, because we, because there's a parallel case to her case, and that is, um, I believe, Alyssa or Alicia Fleischman, who oh, yeah. Matt Taibbi brought. Now, this was, and this is what always blew my mind, because everybody said from day one, all us bloggers making noise, where's your proof, where's your proof, you have all this speculation, and here you had with Fleischman an eyewitness compliance officer with, who said, I saw them commit securities fraud. Now who's she negotiating with? She's giving, much like the person you're profiling, information to the Justice Department, and what does Eric Holder actually do? He just cuts a better deal with Jamie Dimon and that's it, and he's got an eyewitness, no I, criminal I, prosecution. 
Yeah, a, a deal where where the Justice Department is the main recipient of the funds. I mean, they they're literally just taking a cut of the profits yeah. uh, in that particular securities deal. Yeah, that was a securities fraud thing. This was a situation where you literally had millions of pieces of documentary evidence sitting in county recording offices that were turned into crime scenes all over the country. And the, the, some county registers in Massachusetts and North Carolina and California did their own uh, you know, forensic study of their own documents and, and had thousands, tens of thousands of these, these fraudulent documents and presented them to the nation. Uh, the idea that you would throw those cases out uh, where you had all this this huge paper trail, public record paper trail, uh, that you could easily have used to go up the chain, who created this document, who authorized the creation of this document, who was the client, who authorized it at that end, why why were these documents needed, what was the motivation of, of receiving these documents. You could have done all of that, it's basic police work 101, could have done all that investigation. If it didn't work out in the end of that, at least you tried. But uh, I feel like when you have millions of pieces of false evidence that's all littered all over courtrooms across this country, uh, you might have got some better outcomes than what you got. Right, and this goes to what there, there finally was a defense offered, because what you say is completely right and as frustrating as hell to everybody else who says, look, you've got a paper trail, you've got eyewitnesses, you've got outcomes that are clear where people lost money because you're doing some of these are trades where people are being defrauded in other cases are how so what why you know if this is textbook 101 evidence you've got it you've got the smoking gun you've got everything you've got 20 smoking guns so why won't you prosecute and what happened with Lanny Brewer which was very interesting uh, I don't know how many people caught this I thought it made some news because he resigned right afterwards he gave an interview to Frontline yeah. who asked him because Frontline did its own investigation, and somewhere else along this massive blob of a crisis, you found a big section, other people found other They found their own little scandal. I think it was with Countrywide. I'm not positive. or a feeder into the Countrywide. And they said, you know, why don't you... Pro we can find it. He's like, well, I don't have any evidence. I have to actually... And they said, well, here's evidence. And then he finally... They finally dug up a speech he gave. And in the speech he said, he lays awake at night, worried that if he ever brought a criminal action against one of these banks, he would re-collapse the financial system. Right. Now, if that is the concern of this, the, remember, this is the head of the criminal division of the Department of Justice. Right. If that is really his concern, then they're above the law, aren't they? Because he can't ever bring an action if that's what's restraining him, no matter how much evidence is created, because he's not worried about making a case in court. He's worried about if he does make a case in court, he's going to collapse the system. So right. talk about that a little bit. I'll go one better. I mean, Eric Holder said virtually the same thing in open testimony before Congress. Uh, and Eric Holder, even before he was attorney general under in the Clinton administration, wrote a memo called the Collateral Consequences Memo, where he cautioned uh, people who were in investigating and conducting criminal uh, prosecutions against financial institutions and against corporations uh, that they should guard against any collateral consequences that would hurt, you know, the, the bank teller or that would, that would be, you know, difficult in some way and, and would have a de deleterious effect on the economy. This was the thing that was called too big to jail. Right. Uh, that, uh, and, and Eric Holder uh, uh, was really present at the creation of that entire concept. Um, so it's, it's not too surprising. Uh, and I think you saw this at various parts, and not just with prosecutions, but with respect to uh, mitigating foreclosures. You certainly saw uh, the Obama administration more concerned with bank balance sheets than with homeowners. Um, you know, uh, we have the famous quote from Tim Geithner when he's in a meeting with Elizabeth Warren and Neil Borowski, the former Special Inspector General of TARP, where he says that, the, the, the purpose of HAMP is to, quote, foam the runway for the banks, uh, and, and homeowners are, you know, the foam in that, in that analogy. <laughs> the idea is that, uh, you know, these, these, lo these foreclosures, if they're absorbed slowly enough, then we can work our way through it. And so the, the idea was to help banks out by elongating the timelines, and then eventually they can do whatever they want. 
uh, rather than to help homeowners and have that uh, be a spur to the economy. I really actually think it was also kind of um, counterproductive on the part of the administration uh, not to try to clean up this problem because it really was a lead weight on the economy for many years to have all these people in limbo not knowing if they're going to have to leave their house uh, the next week, uh, unable to make purchases, this huge debt overhang that was going on. It, uh, you know, there's a book uh, called House of Debt by uh, Atif Mian and, and Amir Sufi that makes this point and shows through, through microeconomic uh, data that uh, the areas that were most hard hit by foreclosures were the areas that took the longest to come back. Uh, and that was because the depression of consumer spending in those areas because people were so worried about their debt and their debt overhang. So uh, this was a counterproductive thing, and I don't think you can tell the legacy of the Obama administration without telling this story. And just to take it, this point on directly and to give it its due, so what drove a lot of this theory, as I understand it, within the Justice Department and other places is the Enron experience of all things, which is amazing to me, which well, is after they went after Arthur Anderson, all these innocent people who had nothing to do with the Enron fraud, even though clearly some people at Arthur Anderson had something to do with it, they were signing the audits, <laughs> but it, it was too much and it destroyed an entire business and therefore we have to be more cautious about the, the deleterious effects overall of the economy, people's jobs. Now, that is their central argument. So I wonder, as someone who's observed the crisis from sort of soup to nuts here, if you in looking at sort of a more macro, you know, larger picture, do you think that concern is legitimate? And even if it is legitimate, do you think it really outweighs bring the de the deterrence effect right. of bringing criminal prosecution? What's your yeah, I, I think it's kind of overblown. First of all, uh, the workers, the line workers that were auditors at Arthur Anderson, presumably those companies still needed audits that were their clients. Those companies went to other firms, and presumably those individuals went to other firms. There was a uh, sort of a parallel investigation uh, of financial crisis-related uh, material uh, that is cited as the reason why they didn't go harder. And uh, it was a case that was lost against two Bear Stearns traders oh, who man. ran hedge funds. Um, and the Justice Department just botched that case. They, they withheld information uh, that was exculpatory toward the two people that they were uh, uh, prosecuting. And basically after that loss, uh, the edict kind of went down in the Justice Department that we're not going to present any cases unless we are dead, solid, locked, lead pipe cinch that we're going to win, which is just no way to act as a prosecutor. There, you know, you have to be willing to fail uh, in order to to really uh, do your duty and, and fulfill your mission. Uh, and so that I think was a, a, a really misguided approach. And as you said, uh, the deterrent effect was lost, and, and and therefore it's no surprise that every day in America somebody still gets thrown out of their house based on a false document. The, uh, there were settlements that were made against these large uh, mortgage companies that, uh, and, and the presumption behind a settlement like this is that the activity that you're settling on stops, but it didn't in this case. Uh, I, I just wrote a piece last week at The Intercept about this. Uh, you can still, I get emails, I get texts, I get, I get letters every day from people who say, here's the fraud in my case, and it checks out, and, and these things go on and on and on, and these false documents get submitted again and again and again, and mortgage servicing companies continue to abuse their customers, and uh, I, I have to think that the lack of deterrent uh, is, is a long, a, a big reason that's part of that. Well, then that's what you just brought up, takes a question from one of the people watching us who asked, what effect has this had on the title insurance industry? It mm. sounds like you're saying not much, but has it had any effect on the title industry? What happened? The fraud yeah, I think, we're gonna be, I think we're going to be untangling this, this crisis for the next 20 years. Uh, oh, <laughs> Great. We, have, we have already in the title insurance industry the most expensive rates in the world. 
Um, and uh, some of that is just graft. But uh, in this case, it's, it's, there's, there's real risk out there for title insurers. Uh, one of the reasons why uh, uh, the, in 2010 there was this pause in foreclosure operations is that the title insurers said, we're not going to insure any of these loans anymore uh, because we can't be confident in them. And none of that really changed. It's, it's all just happening on a case-by-case -case basis. There's a slog in the courts in the states where you actually need judicial sign-off for a foreclosure, New Jersey being one of them, uh, that I, I have personal experience with several uh, uh, cases there, uh, Florida as well. And uh, it's it, because the state and, and federal law enforcement has sort of taken themselves off the field, uh, it's going on a case-by-case -case basis, you know, trying to, to create precedents uh, one by one by one by one and uh, we're going to be dealing with this for some time I mean the, the title insurance industry uh, clearly saw the risks back in 2010 and not much has changed so I, I, I can't imagine that they think that the risk is, has, has, has disappeared at this point. Well this, this is actually makes me think of something I saw um, related to how and it's, it's talked about in your book that I thought was very interesting which is what and, and I think a larger point too, even about a lot of the work you write, which is that gaming the regulatory system, which is something a lot of these banks are able to do. So, you know, one of AmeriQuest, for example, was originally a savings and loan, and they were under the jurisdiction of the savings right they were, as a savings and loan. And what they decided when they were told that they could no longer take quote unquote liars loans, that they were that, that Congress actually passed something in 1994 or, or something around that time. They couldn't take liars' loans. They said, "Okay, we're no longer S, you know, we're no longer savings alone. No FDIC. We're going to change our name from I think something Long Beach Savings and right. become AmeriQuest. And now that we're a mortgage bank, uh, mortgage company, we're Not no longer bad. under SNL. So you can't tell us what to do anymore, and we can take as many liars' loans as we want. Mm -hmm. And this is something a game that gets played on other levels too. So a lot of people, for example, want uh, the Office of the Comptroller of Currency to be their regulator because he's or well, the person who was there is particularly lax. So now, in fairness, England has a much more centralized system, and they still had a crisis. Right. So, what do you think about regulatory gamesmanship? Is that any because you know that's going to supposedly the next crisis we're going to try to stop with regulators? But if people can play the same game that AmeriQuest slash Long Beach Savings played. There's no question. There's no question that there was a lot of regulatory shopping, so that uh, you know you would try to set it up so that you would be regulated at the federal level by the worst regulator in town. Uh, the Office of Thrift Supervision was really the one that was seen as the plum pick, and you would try to get your your, your bank into that, and uh, OTS was actually the only uh, regulatory agency that was eliminated uh, after the crisis. In Dodd Frank, they just got rid of OTS. Um, uh, OCC, obviously, uh, Office of the Comptroller of the Currency, which uh, regulates national banks, uh, isn't much better. I mean, uh, OCC, the worst thing they did during the crisis was Georgia. The state of Georgia passed an anti-predatory lending law. And the OCC basically said, well, uh, for all our national banks under our jurisdiction, our federal statute preempts that Georgia law, so you don't have to worry about that. Um, and uh, in conjunction with some other people, they basically took the guts right out of that Georgia law, and, and no other state dared try uh, to do anything different. Um, the regulatory structure is way too fractured in the United States. Uh, Paul Volcker... Uh, has a, a solution to that that he's put together that uh, I, I remember seeing last year, uh, mm -hmm. which centralized the regulatory structure in a more coherent way. Um, I, I think that's probably a needed fix. I think that the fact that we have a consumer agency now where consumer protection is its primary goal rather than when it was cited inside the Federal Reserve when it was uh, not even a goal at all. I say that Alan Greenspan viewed regulation like a, an exterminator viewed termites. Um, <laughs> you know, the fact that we have CFPB is helpful. Uh, loans that have been originated in the last three or four years, uh, at least uh, mortgage loans, uh, have performed extraordinarily well. 
Um, we still have this legacy backlog from these loans from 2005, 2006, 2007, but the more recent loans have performed pretty well. Um, you know, I, I do think, however, even though we do have an agency protecting consumers, uh, there needs to be some more regulatory coherence with respect to uh, state and nationally uh, chartered banks. So are you for more centralization? You know, should we have all these different alphabet soup, different yeah. regulators, or...? Yeah, I think, I think there's, there's room to consolidate them. I think okay. we have to look at... Uh, there's also room to, uh, you know, reduce the risk and interconnection at these banks by simply banning a lot of the products that they engage in and uh, cutting them down to size. But, you know, this is a larger story. Uh, uh, questions played out in the, in the presidential campaign, and I think will continue to play out, uh, about the proper uh, size and scale of regulation uh, on the banking industry. And, uh, you know, if, if anything came out of this crisis, it's that the aura behind banks that they, uh, you know, they, are, they have the one true uh, position and the one, the one true knowledge uh, that that shine has has worn off quite a bit, and uh, they are uh, scrambling a little bit. And uh, you know, even though they're there's you know, I'm not weeping for people on Wall Street. They're still uh, uh, enjoying very good profits and enjoying a, 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 a fine a fine lifestyle. But um, the the aura has has worn off a little bit. Now that you have you know someone like Senator Warren in the Senate. Uh, there is an opportunity to create a coalition around some of these ideas, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, uh, a Glass-Steagall reimposition or whether it's uh, breaking up the banks in some form or fashion or whether it's uh, instituting something like postal banking so that you increase financial inclusion uh, and allow uh, uh, the poor to uh, get set up and become part of the financial uh, world, which is uh, ever more important. So, uh, you know, I, 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 I'm hopeful that uh, it seems like the mainstream of the Democratic Party is coming around on some of these issues. Right, and I think the you can talk about the pendulum moving. I think we it's easy to make progress on some level because it was so... I mean, when you would try to explain to someone who wasn't familiar with it, you know the old paradigm was self-regulation. Like right. self-regulation, how could, they, why would, yeah, they said that they would police themselves because obviously if they didn't police themselves, it was not in their interest. They were figuring out that, you know, if, if they really screwed up too bad, they get bailed out. So, yeah, I think the self-regulation age may be over, but we're still, I think, pretty far away from at least where we even were during the New Deal. Oh, yes, yeah, certainly. I mean, you know, I think what we've done is we've partially rolled back the decades of deregulation that we right. had. Uh, going all the way back to Carter, by the way, and I detail that kind of in the book where uh, you know, uh, it was Carter, Reagan, Bush, and Clinton all, and, and Bush too, you know, it was a kind of a continuum of deregulation that led to the conditions being created that could have created a subprime mortgage crisis. It could have, you know, otherwise those, you know, you would not have been able to have such a thing in the 60s and 70s. So um, we partially rolled that back. Uh, you know, Dodd-Frank did what it did, but it, I, I don't believe it went far enough, and uh, it's just going to be a, a slog and a battle uh, because the other side's certainly not going to give up. Speaking of Jimmy Carter and the Trilateral Commission, no, uh, speaking <laughs> of... <laughs> and to speak, but it, honestly, one of the things that struck me in the book that I kind of, you know, read, because I'm oh, reading a policy book, is things you detailed about... Um, and it's non-specific, and obviously you're you know you're you're talking to sources about sort of intimidation episodes is what I I kind of want to use the word episodes where people are on a plane getting harassed, <laughs> they're getting their emails deleted, but it, so and I kind of don't know what to make of it. Is I mean I didn't know what to make of it either, but yeah. I felt like I wanted to tell their truth and the story they were telling me, right. and. You know the the sources I had. Everyone was backing up everybody else. So you know, just to just right. to be be clear about it, um, Lisa and Michael and Lynn, when they delved into this world, uh, they faced uh, you could call it surveillance from unknown sources, mm -hmm. uh, clicks on their telephone line, zapping of emails, uh, 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 Lynn's car being broken into when she lived in a gated community, uh, right on her driveway. Uh, uh, there's this moment that you mentioned where she's on a plane 
and someone turns to her and said, do you know what happened to people who sued banks? They end up dead. Uh, at that point, she had not even sued a bank, so it's unclear why how that person would even know what was going on. Um, you know, it reminded me of sort of the, the counterintelligence program where uh, the idea was to sort of turn movements in on each other, you know, turn them inward on each other and, and create suspicions and, and worry about moles. And I think these guys, you know, sometimes whistleblowers themselves are kind of paranoid people, and right. uh, this fed into that. Uh, now, you know... It, maybe they were all just, you know, too sensitive about this and, and telling things and there were reasonable explanations for all of it. However, uh, you know, outside of these three people, I remember hearing from foreclosure defense attorneys about their uh, offices being ransacked. And uh, there's a story in the book about a very mysterious suicide, which, uh, you know, is corroborated by several different sources inside the Nevada Attorney General's office and also all the way into Florida with what uh, contemporaneously Lisa and Lynn heard at the time. So uh, it's, it's puzzling, and I, I think it needed to be there because uh, it was the environment they were operating in. It was, it was what they felt at that time, that they were you know, taking on these massive institutions and uh, uh, armed with nothing, with no research, right. <laughs> no, no institutional knowledge even. Uh, and, uh, you know, the... It all it I, I can't corroborate any of that fully because it's you know it happens five six years ago but uh, it it seemed plausible to me I mean the, these these stories didn't happen in a vacuum they weren't you know there were people separately telling me them about separate situations uh, and uh, I wanted to present that and let the reader uh, decide for themselves oh yeah no that was the right choice I just I just I remember reading it going wow this is pretty intense and I think that goes to the mentality these people had because one of the things that you'll see from the book is you know most people who are getting screwed in this situation are just they don't know what to do they're confused and these are sort of a select group of people who for whatever reason you go into their I think backgrounds and why they think a certain way particularly Lisa I remember vividly these people just had a certain mentality that they weren't going to do it, so they stood up. But a lot of people didn't stand up, and they just got rolled. So I guess if you're going to try to make an example out of this, and I have to, I just have to, because I'm, look, Lynn, because you talked, you brought up COINTELPRO, so you baited me this. What, wasn't one of the persons you profiled in, yeah. tangentially involved to the, the FBI break-in? Yeah, so uh, Lynn Simoniak uh, in 1971 was kind of an anti-war activist on the campus of, uh, uh, I believe, Bryn Mawr University, and uh, that was very close to where, in in that at that time, uh, the FBI offices in Media, Pennsylvania, were broken into. Um, and I remember this came out only about a year ago. Yeah. Uh, they never found who was responsible for that. And the day that it was found out, Lynn get, sent me an email, and she said, I have to tell you my story. <laughs> she never told anyone. Uh, William Davidon, who was the uh, professor who was kind of the ringleader of that break-in, uh, came to her a few days later and said, uh, at an anti-war rally and said, Lynn, we found your FBI file. And uh, what do you want to do, do with it? She said, I don't want any of it. I just burn it. Just take it away from me. Uh, and then she was surveilled by the FBI, by men in black. Uh, uh, she was uh, surveilled at her, at her place of business where she, she worked as a waitress. She was surveilled at college. The college dean pulled her out of a class and said, you know, the FBI is telling me they think you're responsible or were involved in this in some way. And so what she did is she, one night, she cut her hair short, dyed it, jumped out of the back of her uh, uh, house, apartment complex, and drove up to a commune in New York State where she stayed for three or four months under an assumed name. And uh, finally, she rotated back to the real world. She went to her small town in Illinois where she uh, worked actually as a bank teller. Her mom was a bank teller. Uh, and she went back to this small town, and two days after she started working, the FBI shows up. So uh, she was definitely attuned to uh, this kind of surveillance. And what's funny is that, uh, you know, after that episode, 
she said, I'm never getting involved in any activism ever again. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't you know it, uh, in 2009, 2010, uh, fate intervenes and she gets uh, involved in this activist campaign. That's a great story. Yeah, I saw that in the book and I just thought, wow, what an interesting story. So, um, okay, so that's what kind of... That's why I say the details of this story are better than the broad strokes. Like, all of these very strange things that, that ended up happening, uh, all of them documented. Uh, and it's, it's really, uh, when I heard stories like this, I knew that this was something I had to tell. Yeah, and it made it a great read and a fun read. And even when you get, I know some people get intimidated by finance books and some of the right. material because it's very heavy, it's very technical, but I just, for people who are looking at the book, it, it's, there's a lot of fun stuff and interesting stuff in here and it's very well written so it flow has a good flow to it. You're not going to you're not going to be overwhelmed is what I'm I trying to tell you. I wanted to make it accessible and I wanted to make it a story about people. Uh, the complex mortgage transactions are there but it's really a story about people uh, you know, who refuse to succumb to the sort of shame and humiliation around foreclosures and they decide that they're going to not just fight for their own homes but to fight collectively for everybody and it, it and the sacrifices that they go through in order to accomplish that alright well David Dyan thank you so much for your time the book is chain of title uh, it's a great read and we link to it on the website you can go buy it from uh, New Press Books or go to Amazon or whoever and uh, Dave thanks so much well, thanks, Daniel. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, this opportunity. Have a good one. Bye bye.